Okay, let's go to chapter 5 of uh, Face of Old Testament Studies, starting on page 116. Here's Gordon Wenham, professor of Old Testament uh, in uh, Cheltenham, England. And uh, Gordon Wenham is a very interesting character. Uh, the whole Wenham family is. Uh, they've done a lot of studies in the old area of Old Testament and uh, have produced a good number of writings and are quite interesting. Uh, I think it's an uncle and a nephew primarily that are involved uh, between uh, John Wenham and Gordon Wenham. Uh, his area here is pondering the Pentateuch, the search for a new paradigm. And it really is talking about this idea that uh, the documentary hypothesis had been dying out for the past two decades and uh, where are Old Testament studies going from here? Uh, what's going to replace the documentary hypothesis? And he gets into some of the debate over Abraham and history uh, and what all is involved in those views. Uh, talking about uh, Tommy Thompson and Jacob Van Cedars and their various books. Uh, a fascinating amount of study. A lot of this has to do with the approach we take to the archaeological materials at Nuzi and at Mari and how those are used as il illustrating uh, various aspects of life among the patriarchs. For years, we have cited the Nuzi tablets, the Mari tablets, uh, for helping us understand Abraham in his time and the patriarchs and their times, the customs they have the custom of adopting when Abraham uh, adopted Eliezer into his family, uh, the custom of having a second wife or marrying your wife's handmaiden in order to have children if your wife was barren, uh, inheritance uh, problems and customs, whether or not uh, women were allowed to inherit property. All of these issues are issues that have been in the past illustrated by uh, finds from Nuzi and from Mari. And now the debate is whether or not those are legitimate to use because it would appear that many of the finds at Mari and Nuzi are post-patriarchal. And therefore to read them as illustrative of patriarchal customs is to read them back into history, to extrapolate backwards, a very dangerous process because customs do change from generation to generation, from century to century. And so the question is how do we handle this type of evidence? And the result has been we need to be more careful in what archeological evidence we choose to cite to support certain aspects of biblical teaching, biblical records, or history. And uh, I think as you read through this chapter, you'll pick up some of that, especially between Van Cedars and Thompson, uh, that takes place in uh, about five or six pages of material there. Uh, there's a lot of details here that you don't need to uh, have down for quiz purposes. Basically, what I want you to do is be more aware of uh, what is being talked about to get a general sense of these areas of study. If you're interested in going on to THM studies, watch for topics that are of interest to you because these are topics that are still being developed. They're topics that are debated. They're topics that are hot button issues. They're topics that are perfectly viable for working on for a THM thesis or for a doctoral dissertation or even for an MDiv thesis, especially those areas that are directly related to scripture where you do an exegetical analysis together with studying the particular topic. Question? This is the talk about going forward in the future. Do most people, have they done away with the JEDP? It mm -hmm. seemed like in the reading that they, although they say they went away, they've done away with it, they're still holding on to tenants of it. Right? Yeah, the question is, uh, have they really done away with JEDP even though it's kind of fallen out of favor for about two decades? They haven't really done away with it. As I said before, it's experiencing a revival in this decade and people are talking about it all the more. It may be refined a little bit, it may be, remod it may be redefined, it may be uh, put to a different model in some cases, but it's still there. You still have the documentary hypothesis showing up in discussions. Every time you have Deut Deuteronomic history talked about, every time you have the priestly uh, documents talked about, you're getting into those areas. And right now, a hot button topic with regard to creationism and creation is, is Genesis 1 a priestly document written quite late 
rather than early, not written by Moses, but added later? And is it a means of arguing a sabbatical theology? That's Mark Futaro's viewpoint that it's sabbatical theology written uh, sometime after the time of Ahab. Uh, he believes it had to be written while Israel was in the land. If you look on page 136, as they're looking at uh, the priestly theology, PT is priestly theology, and uh, HS is uh, historical something here. Lost track of where I had it underlined. Uh, you'll have to find that as yourself there and, and looking at it. Uh, holiness, maybe it's holiness subject. H by itself is holiness code. It's related to the priestly. Holiness school, holiness school that's what it is, holiness school. Uh, notice in that middle of the page 136, it's uh, about two thirds of the way through the second paragraph. It starts on the margin, left-hand margin, with the words, what is more? What is more, HS, holiness school, understands that holiness involves morality and social justice as shown by the, all the laws in Leviticus 19. Now, the question comes by this. What does this have to do with righteousness? The comment was made by Moberly that there was no concept of uh, holiness in the patriarchal period. That holiness is a product of the holiness school, the priestly writers, that holiness is not found among the patriarchs. <coughs> Righteousness is talked about among the patriarchs. You have Noah is counted righteous among all his generations. Uh, you have uh, him uh, uh, believing God and it's counted him for righteousness. So how does righteousness relate to what's talked about here? Is righteousness related to holiness? Is holiness related to righteousness? Is it really true that there's no concept of holiness in the patriarchs? Well, what about the establishing of altars, the building of altars? Abraham built a number of them. What about the offering of sacrifices? What about the concept of clean and unclean animals that you see even before the flood? Where is the concept of holiness? And this is the issue I wrote a paper on because as I read through some of these uh, statements being made here in this article by Wenham and later when he cites Moberly about part of this, I had this big question in my mind. Then if you're saying that the patriarchs had no concept of holiness, and you're arguing that holiness is a concept of late date, which is based upon what? Evolutionary pro progressive development of religion, the evolution of religion. Then how, how do you explain these other things? And uh, so I, I went on to write that paper on the basis of what was said on the bottom of page 142 and top of page 143 where Moberly is quoted as saying, finally, the notion of holiness, which from Exodus onward is a basic characteristic of God and a major requirement for Israel, is entirely lacking in the patriarchal traditions. Now, to me, that's a challenge. <laughs> that says, hey, there's something to be done here, something to be written about. This is an issue that they're debating, and there's a question here, and, and how can this be? If you have all this other evidence, there must have been some concept of holiness. And so I went out there and started searching the literature, looking at the scriptures, studying the word righteous, righteousness, looking at altars and the concept of altars, the concepts of sacrifice, going through the documentary hypothesis even and dealing with some of these issues and also looking at other writers and how they dealt with this issue and uh, end up with the concept that when you have righteousness talked about in uh, the patriarchal period, it includes the concept of holiness. Part of being righteous or living a, a life in the accord with the standards of God, which is definition of righteousness, included the concept of holiness and awareness of the separateness of God and awareness of the need to have purity, the necessity of having a separate location of worship, a special place set apart to God, the altar and the sacrifices that they did have a concept of holiness, they just didn't use the word. 
And that's something you and I have to be very careful of. If you did a word study or a search of the word love in the Old Testament, you'd come away thinking that love is not taught very much in the Old Testament. You just have a few passages in Leviticus that deal with loving your neighbor, and beyond that, there's nothing there that sounds anything like the New Testament. And that's because that sometimes the descriptions of love in the Old Testament don't include the use of the word. Therefore, if you do a concordant study of the occurrences of words in the Old Testament and the New, that does not exhaust a topic. If you're dealing with the concept of love, did you include the concept of Hosea marrying this woman who was a prostitute? And yet that has to be considered. There are issues talked about in Scripture. Look at the Trinity. How many times is the word Trinity found in Scripture? Zero. But we believe in a doctrine of Trinity. Why? Because the concept's taught in Scripture. You do not have to have the word itself utilized in order to have the concept present. Covenant. If you look up all the passages where covenants are mentioned, you can miss where covenants are actually talked about because you only limited yourself to those areas where you have covenant mentioned. Topics and concepts have to be looked at carefully. Steve? Okay, good. Good uh, pointing out there that repentance is another one. You have to look at the term turning. You have to look at a number of possibilities. You cannot exhaust the topic in Scripture if you limit yourself to the usage of the word. And that's one of the dangers of word studies, is that in word studies, we tend to limit ourselves to only the specific mention of something, and we haven't really dealt with the concept as it's found elsewhere in Scripture. Uh, go back to page 138. 138, second paragraph, an old saw quoted here, put in double quotes for us, something you need to remember. Be able to complete it if you receive it halfway stated. It's in the second paragraph. It's in the uh, sixth line down. But as archaeologists say, absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. Know that. Okay? Know it. Absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. Until 1896, I think it was, there was no evidence for the Hittites. So many took that as evidence of absence. So they began to say, obviously they never existed. They're mythological. And because David had not been found mentioned in extra biblical inscriptions, people began to say, David is like King Arthur. He's a myth. He never existed. And then a Tel Dan Stella was recovered. And here you have the mention of the house of David. Then we find out after that, that in reality, there were at least two or three other finds that had mentioned David prior to that, some of them dating back to the end of the, eight, of the 19th century. But they had not been revealed or used or talked about because people who believe that the uh, scriptures are myth mythological and that David was a myth were embarrassed that there was a mention of him in some of the extra biblical material. And so when the debate came on the Tel Dan Stella and that people began to say, well, this must be a forgery because David never existed. He's not a real person. And well, that, what does that do to your New Testament then? In the mention of David. I mean, that, if David did not exist, we have a serious problem here, right? And that's where we get into the minimalist and maximalist controversy. And the people who say that the Bible contributes minimal content to a knowledge of history and fact. Those are the minimalists. And they are the ones who denied the existence of David. So to them, absence of evidence is evidence of absence. But the old saw is, and it's been proven time and time again, absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. The silence of scripture or the silence of extra biblical literature is not evidence of absence. You have to be very cautious of that. Otherwise, you find yourself face to face with the Hittites again. <laughs> they weren't thought to exist for centuries. Now we know they did exist, an entire empire, a language, everything. It's fantastic. Yes, um, PJ. Did Moberly ever respond to you? Uh, Moberly never responded to me. Okay. <laughs> 
All right, let's go on here to chapter six. Yes, sir. If we carry that over the text itself, I mean, we, we read the text and say, well, notice here Jesus doesn't say such and such, or Paul doesn't say such and such. I mean, don't we kind of run into some, some challenging interpretive issues if we carry that principle over the text? Yes, you do. The question is, do we run into challenging interpretations at times if we talk about, uh, well, it's here even though it's silent? Uh, we're beginning to try to read between the lines, read the white spaces. Uh, yes, you do have that problem. We have to be very cautious, that careful of it. Uh, and we do realize that if there is absence of evidence or if there's absence of statement about something in Scripture, there's probably a very good reason for it. Uh, we have to wait and watch carefully and go through. Uh, for example, we were talking about the uses of words. That's a different category of absence. An absence of uses of a word doesn't mean absence of, con of, the, of the content or of the concept. Uh, but when you're dealing with factual things, uh, like the existence of a people, uh, quite frankly, we accept the prima facie evidence of Scripture. Uh, we're not reliant upon extra biblical proof. We accept this as the Word of God, therefore we're confident that eventually the Hittites would be found. Uh, doesn't matter if we haven't heard of them, they will be found. And so uh, if there are other such instances in Scripture of peoples or places that still have not been discovered or identified in archaeology or history or geography, we can rest assured that one day that very well might be found. Although when we get into the area of archaeology, we'll talk about how much of the evidence really exists or has uh, survived. It's only a fraction, really, that has survived. And so we're, we're gambling to begin with. It's a, it's a long shot to find things that are directly related to Scripture. And so every time we do find something directly related to Scripture, it is a big thing. It is quite uh, an issue. It is something very important. And uh, that's the way it was with the Tell Dan Stell and the mention of David. Very important, very significant. Does that kind of answer your question? We'll come back to it more in archaeology and deal with that. Let's look at chapter 6 on historiography by V. Phillips Long, who's professor of Old Testament at Covenant Theological Seminary in St. Louis. Uh, writing on the historiography of the Old Testament, uh, one of the things he talks about here is the Trollschian-style historical criticism on page 146. Some of you may have marked that and said, what in the world is he talking about there? And if you had not attended a secular college and had not read about uh, Ernst Trollsch, you may not have the slightest idea of what's going on, but fortunately, Long explains it on the top of page 154. And he says that the Trollschian analogy has to do with three principles. And he names the three principles there on the top of page 154. Criticism, analogy, and correlation. Criticism, analogy, and correlation. Criticism has to do with the skepticism one has toward their sources. The analogy is the idea of uh, trying to present human experience uh, in the past history uh, in terms of present knowledge and present history and experience. And correlation is the potential of historical causation to either natural forces or human agency. So what has caused these things? Uh, why did Israel leave Egypt in reality? Uh, as we look at all those things, there's a cause, a historical cause, a sociological cause. And so those who are following the Trollschian analogy are looking for causation. They want to identify a reason for Israel leaving. And that results in different theories then of how they left Egypt and why they left Egypt. In fact, many will argue that they never really did leave Egypt the way described in Scripture. They just kind of trickled out little by little as one family left and another family. And eventually they gathered in the middle of Canaan. And eventually they had a peaceful revolt from within the Canaanite society. They had infiltrated it so much that they eventually took over and took control. Kind of like the uh, uh, Mexican-American influence in Los Angeles. Uh, that uh, one day this is going to be a Spanish-speaking area. Uh, was before, it's probably going to be again. Uh, you have changes in populations. And they come in and you have people that rise up and... Now we have a, um, a Mexican-American mayor, a Hispanic mayor, mayor, 
And uh, there will probably be many others in the future. We had one way back in the past too. But areas go through histories and peoples go through cycles. And as you have peoples migrating and moving to different lands, they go through changes in their history, in their languages, in their society, in their ethics, in their religion, everything changes. And so people look at a model like Los Angeles and Hispanic influence and infiltration and, and becoming the dominant force here, which causes the black community here lots of pangs and uh, trouble because they were the majority minority community until the Hispanics became the majority minority community. And there's conflict there that we have in the jails now. You have rioting and Castaic in the jails. You have uh, Hispanics killing blacks, blacks killing Hispanics. Uh, we had the LA riots a few years back where you had Koreans involved in the riots, protecting their area of the city. This can happen with any cultural group, any ethnic group within our city. This is history. This is the way societies grow. We talked about sociology. This is a sociological area that a study of history of Palestine, for example, would be fascinating to see. The ebb and flow of societies, of peoples, everything else. And so this is brought to bear upon the study of the text. And the Trollshin thing here looks at that first. But notice here the first element of the Trollshin dynamic, the Trollshin analogy, is skepticism. Skepticism. In other words, they approach the scriptures with the hermeneutics of doubt. I will not believe what the Bible says unless it is supported by extra biblical evidence which proves that what the Bible says is true. That's the Trollshin analogy. And that is dominating not just liberal scholarship, but evangelical scholarship. Uh, this is mentioned by Kenneth Kitchen. He said, those who look at the Assyrians and their records and the extra biblical records from the Assyrians, there's a huge amount out there. And they began to be uncovered way back in the 1700s, in the early 1800s, and on through the 1800s, a, a huge amount of material. And even with the Iraq war, there are more discoveries being made in Iraq about the ancient Babylonians and ancient Assyrians. So as we get all of this evidence together, people are very high on the Assyrians. And so they will make statements, even evangelicals will say, if the Assyrians do not mention the Chaldeans, then the Chaldeans did not exist in Genesis 11. If Genesis 11 mentions the Chaldeans, it is an anachronism. It must be textual updating because the Assyrians do not mention them. And therefore, the Assyrian records starting around the 9th century BC, if they do not mention them, then that is evidence enough for me to doubt what the scriptures say. And even evangelicals have that type of skepticism about the text, where they are actually putting the external, extra biblical, secular sources above the biblical text in authority. And of course, what Kitchen's reply to that is, he says, if you take that stance, then do away with all the pharaohs. Because there are only three pharaohs in late dynasties mentioned in the Assyrian records. So that will also prove an absence of evidence is evidence of absence of pharaohs. <laughs> you see? You cannot have your cake and eat it too. You cannot deny the existence of the Chaldeans in patriarchal period on the basis of Assyrian evidence unless you are willing to apply the same standard to the existence of Egyptian pharaohs mentioned in the patriarchal period. Okay? Gentlemen, beware of this. It is something that is rampant in evangelicalism. I hear it in ETS all the time. I'm doing a paper in the regional ETS uh, coming up that deals with the problem of the Old Testament, deals with current issues, and this is one of them that I'll be talking about. And uh, Tom Finley, my good friend at Talbot, wrote back and he says, wow, he says, that is likely to generate a lot of discussion <laughs> and uh, be a topic of interest at the meetings in April. And uh, I'm afraid he's right. I'm afraid he's right because I think that a large number of people Evangelicals in the southwestern area, members of ETS, 
coming from Bethel West, coming from uh, Westminster West, coming from all the different schools in the area, even from Talbot itself, there will be people coming who will doubt the biblical record in areas like this and will put the extra biblical evidence above the biblical record. And so we have a lot to talk about. And uh, my, my role is to try to instigate discussion of this and also to try to get people, call them back to finding the prima facie evidence of the text itself. We're not dependent upon this external material to make these kinds of decisions. We're not following the Trollian analogy of a skeptical approach to the biblical text. We do not follow the hermeneutics of doubt. We follow what Robert Dick Wilson called prima facie evidence of Scripture. And therefore, we accept the Scripture for what it says until equally authentic and ancient evidence is found to the contrary. What does that do to the Chaldeans in Genesis 11? It means until we find equally authentic evidence that is equally as old as Moses, to the contrary, will we find this in any realm of question where we have to defend what the Scripture says. And I think it can be demonstrated and proven that there's plenty of evidence out there to show that Moses' naming of the Chaldeans in Genesis 11 is perfectly accurate. And they did exist then and were around then at that period of time. And as time goes by, maybe a discovery will be made like that of the Hittites. And the Chaldeans will finally come to light as being a long-lived people having a long history in the ancient Near East going all the way back to the Tower of Babel. Yes, sir? I don't remember which people he referred to, but um, you know, God said he would wipe away the remembrance of some people. Right. Um, and I don't suppose there's any reason to doubt he did that with other people too. Okay, the question is, uh, if God has said he'd wipe out the memory of certain peoples, could that be done with other peoples as well? And could it be with some of these peoples we're talking about, like the Chaldeans, wiping out the memory of them in those early days? That's perfectly possible. That's a theological answer to the problem. It doesn't totally resolve the problem. It offers a potential solution. It has to be considered. It has to be one of those things considered. If God says he'll wipe out the memory of a people, and if we can't find any evidence of them, that's probably evidence they did it, did it very well <laughs> to do it. But uh, it helped to have direct evidence one way or the other. Yes, sir? Um, is this Trollian thing any different than uh, what Archer had the Hegelian in the excursus? He it's, right. It's, it's not very much different at all. It's a little bit of a refinement. Ernst Trollsch refined Hegel's uh, synthetic model. His, uh, you have a hypothesis, you have an antithesis, and then you have a synthesis model, a three-point model. And basically, that's what Trolsch is working from and building on and is developing that further. I believe, uh, or is Trolsch before Hegel? And that Suddenly I have this doubt, <laughs> have this question in my mind, and now I'll have to go look it up and make certain. Who depended upon whom? Was it Hegel dependent on Trolsch or Trolsch on Hegel? I'll have to answer that again later. Yes, Stephen. I was just going to say that Dr. Parnell does a good survey of this development in the Jesus Crisis. Yes, he does. Page 95. Page 95 in the Jesus Crisis. David Farnell works, Professor Farnell works on uh, the uh, Trollian analogy. Yes. So when you're studying this, you know, this go, you, know you, you look at this and you say, wow, this is kind of extraneous, this is trivia, and this is really weird, and it's hard to remember, and all this. Listen, you're going to run across it more than once. If you have Dr. Farnell, Dr. Thomas dealing with the Gospels, it's going to come up again. If you're out there working in the world and you're talking with people and you start witnessing to uh, university students and you start dealing with people who have philosophy as a background, politics as a background, logic as a background, eventually someone's going to ask you about Ernst Trolsch. Eventually someone's going to ask you, going to use his model to test you on something. And uh, it's important to realize this. And, and the thing that's most disturbing to me is that the way that some of these parts are carried over into evangelicalism, the skepticism especially, that's the one that bothers me the very most. Causation, I understand that. Analogy, I understand that. The skepticism is a little bit more problematic when we come to dealing with Scripture. That is a, a, a larger issue. Uh, on page 159, we have minimalist mentioned. Page 159 is right at the bottom of the page there. 
above the footnotes and halpern of minimalists of, uh, of all sorts. Uh, you should be able to identify what a minimalist is, what a maximalist is. I gave that definition earlier. Let me give it again. A minimalist is someone who says the scripture has minimal input with regard to history and fact. The maximalist says it has maximum input. If the scripture speaks to a historical event, it is accurate. If a scripture mentions a historical person, it is accurate. If you want to find out where a certain tell or a village is located, go to the scriptures and walk the Holy Land with the scriptures open and you'll find it like uh, Nelson Glick used to do and like uh, Yigel Yadin and many others, famous archaeologists who uh, found many of the sites in the Holy Land by following the scriptures, reading an open Bible as they went from place to place. Sir Flinders Petrie, the father of modern archaeology, did the same thing. They were maximalists. William Foxwell Albright is a maximalist. He was the one who started the biblical uh, archaeology concept in America, which we'll talk about when we get the archaeology section. So a minimalist is anyone who says that the scriptures have a minimal impact and a minimal content on history, historical fact, and fact. Uh, maximalist says the scripture has maximum input on that. Maximum authority as opposed to minimum authority. On page 161, at the end of the first paragraph, today's assured results may well be tomorrow's discarded theories, and if there is any lesson to be learned from the biblical archaeology debates of the past, it is that we should go slowly in declaring just what archaeology has proved or disproved. That's on page 161, the end of the top paragraph. Uh, that is something we're going to talk about a great deal when we get to archaeology. I'm going to have lots of slides, lots of pictures, we're going to use videos. We're going to uh, go through and look at a large number of archaeological finds, talk about their impact, talk about their abuse and misuse, both by evangelicals and non-evangelicals. Uh, we talked about that already when we talked about Tommy Thompson, when we talked about uh, Jacob Van Cedars, when we talked about the issue of Abraham and his historicity, when we talked about the Newsy and Marie evidences. Uh, we have abuse on both sides, and we need to be very cautious how we talk about things. When I was in seminary, I was taught the Qumran scrolls proved that the Septuagint was the dominant text at Qumran, and therefore the Hebrew text needed to be amended drastically in accord with those finds. Today, 5% is acknowledged. 5% of the texts at Qumran are acknowledged to have Septuagint uh, background or to be equivalent to the Hebrew forelaga, the Hebrew base for the Greek Septuagint. That's very different than what I was taught. I was taught that the script of Hebrew was continuous with no breaks between words, no word divider, no word division. And uh, today, it's the exact opposite. The evidence is they had word dividers and word division all along. And so uh, the fact that archaeological evidence is used in various ways by various people you need to look at it carefully and cautiously. Consider the source, consider what they're trying to prove, and carefully look at the evidence to see if it really does apply. And when you're preaching, and when you're studying, when you're using illustrations from archaeology, you must do the same thing. You must be careful. You must be cautious in drawing your illustrations from archaeology. On page 165, the top of the page, the standard historical critical approach leaves little or no room for God and history. Social science approaches often little room for the Old Testament texts themselves. And modern literary approaches sometimes show little interest in historical concerns at all. That is quite a quote at the top of page 165. That really summarizes where we're at right now. Because where the historical issues used to be the focal point, literary issues are now the focal point. And sociological issues are on the rise. And you find here that sometimes they have very little room for God, for history, or for fact. Uh, they tend to be sometimes very subjective and not very objective. Doesn't mean that they all are like that. Doesn't mean that we throw out everything and lose the baby with the bathwater. 
we've got to take a close look at it and evaluate what there is of worth to us in the various approaches and views. The three chief principles of Trolsch are discussed further on page 169 in great detail. It goes through the three principles, the principle of criticism, the principle of analogy, and the principle of correlation. Since I've mentioned this now twice, I would suggest that you know the three principles for a quiz. The principle of criticism, the principle of analogy, and the principle of correlation. And I would suggest you take a good look at it and read page 169 to try to get a grasp on it, uh, to get a grip on it, know exactly what's being talked about, un have a basic understanding of it. Uh, on page 173, you have one of the clearest evangelical statements and declarations made in the book. Uh, and I appreciate them when I find them because it's great reading then. And Phillips Long is very good at this. He's a good historian and he's also a sound evangelical. This is on page 173, the second paragraph. Page 173, the second paragraph. He's talking here about, uh, he says, reasons for ignoring the apparent historical truth claims of much Old Testament narrative vary from scholar to scholar. For some, the failure may stem from a kind of a primal rebellion that insists on asking, did God really say? Now that's getting down to brass tacks. That's getting down to reality. This is pastoral material here, men. You can apply this in talking with people and counseling with people. Is it, are they just expressing a primal rebellion? Did God really say? And I've had that in Sunday school class, had a, young, uh, a man stand up and say, I don't care what Paul said, God could not have meant that. <laughs> That's primal rebellion. <laughs> All right? For others, it may stem from a methodological straitjacket that insists that texts describing divine action are historically suspect. There's your hermeneutics of doubt, your skepticism principle of Trolsch. That's a methodological straitjacket some people get into. They're putting extra biblical evidence over biblical evidence in authority. The third is the naive assumption that literature and history are mutually exclusive categories, that you can always keep them separate. The corrective for the first type of failure comes only with a radical change of heart and mind, what the Bible calls repentance. How much more clear could we be? The corrective for the second involves making adjustments to the method so as to bring it into line with theistic reality. Recognizing the re existence of God, the authority of God, and the reality of the supernatural. The corrective for the third involves simply recognizing that literature and history are not mutually exclusive concepts. You can have fiction that is historical fiction. You can have fiction based upon history and reality. If any of you like to read Louis L'Amour's books, Louis L'Amour, good Western writer, was a very accurate historian. Every story he wrote is a story that is fictitious, but the setting geographically, historically, the artifacts that are described from the clothing to the butter churn are historically accurate. He was meticulous in every single detail. If you can identify, if he identifies the place that he is writing about, you can take book in hand and go to that place and you can see exactly what he's talking about. Nice, easy reading. Nice and easy to read to relax. Louis Lamar, great reading. But if you want to know something about Western geography and Western history, take him along. Fiction, teaching history, geography. You see, they aren't exclusive. Sometimes they are but many times they aren't. Uh, those of you from a Russian background, uh, there's Russian literature is that way. It is tied directly to the land and its history, even the fiction where you can go and you can see and you can watch. Just pick up a Russian writer, begin to read, and if you've been in Russia or if you go there, you can do the same thing. Chapter 7, our last point here. K. Lawson Younger on Early Israel and Recent Biblical Scholarship. He's Professor of Old Testament, Semitic Languages, and Ancient Near Eastern History at Trinity International University in Deerfield, Illinois. And uh, he has done a great deal of work in this area, a great deal of writing 
Uh, he is what we would call one who has been in the biblical archaeology camp, uh, the biblical theology camp. And uh, he believes in the conquest model for the conquest of, of uh, Canaan by Israel. The models are on page 178 and following. Know these models. Know their names. Know what they are about. What does the conquest model say? What is the peaceful infiltration model? What is the revolt model? And there are several revolt models. Don't bother about breaking them down into different ones. Just understand what is meant by a revolt, whether it's a peasant revolt model or whether it's something else. Uh, those are important issues to understand. What are the three models of Israel's taking over Canaan? And then over to page 195. Page 195. The third paragraph, according to Deaver, this is William Deaver, the common early Israelite pottery turns out to be nearly identical to that of the late 13th century BC. It comes right out of the late Bronze Age urban Canaanite repertoire. Moreover, the Israelite alphabetic script may simply be a development of the Canaanite alphabetic tradition. Now what's the argument going on here? Part of the argument, and Deaver's one of these guys who says that he doesn't trust the history of the book of Judges. It's not dependable, it's not accurate. And he doesn't, depend, he doesn't trust the history of many other books of the Old Testament either. He's an extreme skeptic in many ways. But the argument here that's involved is that there is, and this starts way back earlier where there was a list of uh, things on page 185 where there is a list there of three different things. Pillared four house rooms, use of silos for grain storage, the hot sair uh, style elliptical settlement uh, compound, the village reference there. Looking at all these things, the argument is that there's no evidence of Israel in Palestine. Ancient Israel, not there. Now this plays in the hand of politics today. This plays in the hand of the Hamas leadership in Palestine. Because one of their arguments is the land doesn't belong to Israel, it belongs to them. And every time you have an argument brought up that says that Israel is not there, and it denies what the scripture says, then it removes the scripture from being prima facie evidence as a document that proves Israel's title to the land. And up until the last two centuries, that has been assumed that that was a title deed of Israel to land because the Bible is the prima facie documentary evidence that they were there and that it was given to them by God. So the, the movement now is to disprove that to deny it, to say it never happened, to explain away the conquest, to explain away God's giving it to them, to explain away the redemption out of Egypt. There was no such deliverance. There was no such redemption. Well, God says if there wasn't, then he's not God. That makes an interesting parallel, doesn't it? And you go further here, and why is there an absence of Israelite architectural and cultural elements in Palestine from the date of the conquest and shortly after? Jeremy? Because they moved into the homes that were provided for them. Absolutely. They moved into the homes that God said would be there. He said, you're going to live in homes you did not build. You're going to feed from vineyards you did not plant. You're going to inhabit cities you did not found. Look at Deuteronomy 6, 10 to 11. Look at Joshua chapter 24, verse 13. These are evidences. We should not expect to see Israelite, quote unquote, characteristic cultural, physical elements of buildings, villages, uh, cisterns, or anything else. We should not expect to see that in those early period. Uh, we should expect to see purely Canaanite, and that's exactly what we find. It matches what the scripture says. Look at the last paragraph on page 195. They talk about pig husbandry. It is an ethnicity debate, they say here. They say that pig husbandry being dominant in Israel, showing that there are pig bones in various places and sites, pig bones even next to altars, proves that Israel was not in control of the land because Israel, Israelites were kosher. They followed the law. And therefore, that means that if you find evidence of pigs, pig husbandry in the land, that proves Israel did not have control of the land or were not present. 
So there's an absence of Israelite presence because of this. How do you respond to that? How do you respond? Yes, Stephen. Okay, they did not drive everyone out of the land, number one. What's another argument? They struggled with being obedient to God. Okay, they struggled with being obedient to God. They outright disobeyed him time and time again. Moses had a song that he uh, composed through the direction of God, the Holy Spirit, in Deuteronomy chapter 32, that in essence celebrated their stubbornness and their disobedience. It wasn't really celebrating, it was to remind them. It was a reminder, it was to nag them with it, all right? What about Luke 15 and Matthew 8, where you have uh, pigs being raised in the land of Palestine where Jesus can throw the demons into them? Uh, Tell me about that. I mean, these were Jews who were supposedly cured of idolatry, returned from exile. And you have them then indicating that uh, uh, they raise pigs. Now, there's plenty of evidence in Scripture to demonstrate, to prove that absence of the Israelites does not depend upon the presence of pig husbandry. All right? They could still be there. Gentlemen, part of this whole thing is the fact that there's just too much focus and attention placed upon things external to Scripture without taking a good, careful look at what the Scripture itself says. The Scripture explains this. It's like the absence of evidence of the Israelites for 40 years wandering in the wilderness. Whether they were 100,000, 600,000, 2 million, or 3 million, we've always been told you expect evidence to be present. Why wouldn't there be evidence present? Well, number one, they wouldn't recognize it as Israelite. It'd be Egyptian because they came from Egypt as slaves. And what they brought out of Egypt with them was they borrowed from the Egyptians. Number two, their sandals and their clothing did not wear out by a supernatural act of God to provide for his people in the wilderness. Number three, they did not have to dig cisterns. God provided water out of the rock. Number two, they did not have to have lots of clay pots to carry food around and preserve it. He gave them manna, and the manna could not be kept for more than a day, except for that that they gathered before the Sabbath. You begin looking at the biblical evidence, and the biblical evidence fits the physical evidence. It's not that the Israelites weren't there. It's that the normal evidence you look at was not there because God did not allow them to live a normal existence in the wilderness. They did not have to go through the same things that normal people go through in everyday life. So all of those things help to point this out. Now in the conclusion here, and we'll have to wrap this up here, and we'll come back to textual criticism then next week. Uh, We didn't get back to it. But you'll be ready for your quiz now. Uh, You'll also be ready for the quiz if you go over the lecture so far on textual criticism and note the major points that we talked about. Things like uh, what are the major manuscripts? What's the the manuscript for uh, the Biblia Hebraica Stuttgartensia? Um, Things like that. Uh, What are the Masora Parva? Who were the Masoretes? Issues like that. Uh, Very basic. I don't go into great detail. I'm not going to give you a Masora Parva and have you interpret it. Anything like that. It'll be basic stuff. If you've kept up, if you've followed along, you understood the basics of what we've been talking about, it'll be there. Uh, Talk about preservation. I warned you about concepts of preservation there, that that would definitely be there. Be ready with scripture verses to support both the uh, divine side and human side of preservation. It's there in your syllabus. And then the rest of this here, they go into the uh, extra biblical text, the Merneptah Stella, the Amarna tablets, tribal organization, the role of the book of Joshua, we'll get more into that in uh, the area of uh, uh, Archer when he covers it. Uh, look on page 204 for a final point. Uh, no, there are two, two points to follow here real quickly. Uh, page 204, the very top there, right underneath the number two, it is important to remember the limitations of different archaeological methods. The fallacy of assuming that the material culture has a logical and necessary priority over the written evidence should be avoided. Never neglect the written evidence. But this is the way that people are going today. Even evangelicals are giving the material evidence, the extra biblical evidence, the archaeological evidence, authority over, assuming it's superior to, 
that evidence that's included in scripture. And then on page 206, page 206, the last page of this chapter, uh, down about the fifth line, the biblical traditions when read properly. Now that's a weasel phrase because what do you mean by that? How do you read it properly? Is it by the historical, grammatical, uh, contextual method or is it some other type of method? Uh, when read properly, what is meant by that? In whose judgment? They do reveal a viable account very much in the tradition of conquest accounts from the ancient Near East as a whole. In other words, he's arguing here. Uh, Younger is arguing for the conquest model. He accepts the biblical record as it is. Archaeologically, the material cultural remains are highly partial and selective. They're just a fragment of the original evidence. This fact concerning the paucity of evidence means that the archaeological evidence too is incomplete as a source for historical reconstruction. In other words, the Bible record is more complete than the archaeological record. Another reason to listen to the written record. It has the more complete picture. 